Hey, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of the Ruby Rogues podcast. This week on our panel, we have John Epperson. Hello, everybody. Dave Kimura. Hey, everyone. Luke Stutters. Hello, everyone. And Charles Max Wood from Top End Devs. And this week, we're going to kind of speculate on the future. What's what's coming next? What what does that mean? Where does Ruby fit in? Um, maybe other stuff that maybe Ruby doesn't quite fit into. We'll, we'll kind of see where this goes. Hey, folks, this is Charles Max Wood from Top End Devs. And lately, I've been working on actually building out Top End Devs. If you're interested, you can go to topendevs.com slash podcast, and you can actually hear a little bit more about my story, about why I'm doing what I'm doing with Top End Devs, why I changed it from uh, devchat.tv to Top End Devs. But what I really want to get into is that I have decided that I'm going to build the platform that I always wished I had with devchat.tv, and I renamed it to Top End Devs because I want to give you the resources that are going to help you to build the career that you want, right? So whether you want to be an influencer in tech, whether you want to go and just max out your salary and then go live a lifestyle with your family, your friends, or just traveling the world or whatever, I, I want to give you the resources that are going to help you do that. We're going to have career and leadership resources in there, and we're going to be giving you content on a regular basis to help you level up and max out your career. So go check it out at topendevs.com. If you sign up before my birthday, that's December 14th. If you sign up before my birthday, you can get 50% off the lifetime of your subscription. Once again, that's topendevs.com. Dave, you're the one that proposed this. Did I oversimplify it or is there more to it that you wanted to talk about? Well, most of this comes from me having read an article and found a website called Mojo Vision. And the idea of it is it's wearable technology. It's a contact lens that provides a heads up display for a augmented reality. And just seeing that was really cool. And it kind of made me start thinking about just all the Hollywood interpretations of what the future is going to look like with heads up displays, wearable technology, that kind of thing. And it really mm-hmm. made me start thinking like, what is this going to, how is this going to shape the world? Because if you think about just 20 years ago, if you had a cell phone, it was a big brick of a thing that you had to carry around, you know, or with some big battery pack. But now today, mm-hmm. You look at cell phones and they are these slim mobile devices that you can look up anything. You can play games, watch movies, communicate with others visually via text or via phone. So just the way technology has changed in the past 20, 30 years, let's take a look at it from today, 20, 30 years from now. What is it going to look like? So We have a few emerging technologies. We have VR headsets and augmented reality. We have Web3 and whatever else is out there. And so I'm interested, you know, to just kind of talk about how is this going to change the world? Because it is going to change it one way or another, especially as or if it becomes widely adopted like smartphones have. So, Mm -hmm. you know, I think the whole iPhone really led to the sunsetting of Macromedia or Adobe Flash because they never supported it on the iPhone. So that really changed how we developed websites back then. If you remember those days before the iPhone, any website that you Mm -hmm. went to was all flashy, had a lot of animation, did all kinds of crazy things, and it was all Flash-based. And finding, you know, a modern SaaS kind of application back then wasn't really the popular thing. It was making these flashy websites with Flash action script with some kind of server back end. So, you know, I'm so glad those days were over. I hated the whole Flash era. (laughs) But what is that going to look like for the future if wearable tech like VR headsets become so small factor that you just put on a small pair of glasses that has your prescription or whatever, and then you have access to everything that you would at a desktop computer, a laptop, or your phone. And same thing with you know, it's free. Fun. You know, how is that going to change things with decentralized access to information? Where if something gets shared on the internet today, it may not be the easiest thing to get removed or to get rid of, but it is technically possible to some degree. But with a decentralized platform, there is no calling up some agency or somebody to have something removed. And that could be for the good or the bad. 
you know, you can have mm-hmm. propaganda stuff that's put out there that, or deep fakes put out there that can really disrupt the actual truth from getting out. Or you could have the truth or the information that the public needs to know about, but it's being kept back by whatever government or agency or whatever. So it's interesting that you you bring some of this up. I'm just going to touch on where I've seen both of these things within the last few years. So I haven't been for the last two or three years, but I used to go to CES every year and there was a company that yes, so did I, right? Glasses. Jan- yeah, it's usually in January. But they so they had a prototype of some glasses that connected to your smartphone and provided a heads up display and things like that in kind of that AR world, right? And and it was glasses like you wear now. They were just a little bit heavier as opposed to you know kind of the Oculus and stuff where that's the, you've got this giant thing on the front of your face. As far as the Web three technologies and decentralized information. I did an interview with Stephen Chin from JFrog, and they are working on a sort of, and I, I'm trying to remember the name of it, so I'll have to go find it, um, put a link in the show notes. But they have basically a package repository, kind of like Ruby Gems or NPM, that they're putting together, and all of the information in that is being stored in a Web3 style blockchain database. Now, there are like 10 or 12 rather large companies like Oracle and JFrog and some of these others that are participating in the, so it's semi-centralized, I guess, because those 10 servers are the ones that form the consensus as opposed to kind of the public consensus you get on Bitcoin and things like that. But I see both of these trends starting to pick up or having been innovated on already Now, whether you get to the point where those glasses are completely independent of a smartphone or whether you have some other system out there that moves away from consensus among these 10 nodes or 12 nodes to a consensus of everybody impacts the the network. It's it's interesting because we are, I think we're moving that way faster than a lot of people think. Seems kind of pie in the sky. And but but a lot of this stuff is already being created here and it's it's interesting to see where this could go now in 20 or 30 years are we even going to be talking about these kinds of technologies i don't know but you know in the, at least within the next five to ten years i think we're going to experiment with them enough to know exactly where they fit into the landscape of what we're, the world we could have so anyway i just wanted to chime in because you know you're talking about hey this stuff could be coming and i my experience says that a lot of it's here already yeah i think Speaking to Web3 specifically, right? Like, because I think that one is probably the one that's going to... I'm not saying that glasses won't affect us, right? Or that VR in general won't affect us. But I do feel like Web3 probably most directly affects us. But my perspective on like Web3 in particular is... So I feel like Web2, when when people started talking about Web2, it was a backwards look at like what, what had already... A trend that had already been happening, right? So people were like, mm-hmm. oh, let's describe this trend that's already happening and has already been happening and let's call it web 2 but like web 3 is like people talking about something that's not really even built yet and so like i think there's a little like i definitely feel like there's a lot of reticence in the community about that because we're like especially after you know i know we talked a little bit about this but i think especially after like i'm sure that you guys have experienced this too there's so much bs in general around the crypto community so much scamming and things that has gone on that people i think people are very sensitive and offended and and worried i mean i i'm not gonna lie like i have these fears too that like web3 is just basically a bunch of rich people wanting other people to do to do this work for them and take the credit right like it's like when we were at rails oh, i was at rails conf and there was this one of the after party events was like a web3 get together thing and you know i was like sweet i'm going to go to this thing because i want to go actually like talk to like some other developers who might be doing web3 but like i was going with my buddy and i was like but hey if it's if it's just like a bunch of people trying to hire some people for their companies i was like i'm gonna bail instantly and we we went and it turned out that it wasn't the web3 thing it was something else entirely but like i feel like that's my posture right now which is like i want to talk to other developers about this stuff because it's interesting but i I don't want to talk to somebody who like basically wants me to to leave my good job, do a bunch of work for them, have the risk that I might not get paid, right? And have to just deal with that all that mess all over again. But I also feel like Web3 is risky 
for me and for other people because I kind of feel like I, I just really can't think of good use cases outside of really narrow. Like, okay, so for example, like you are in some, you're like a rebel in some country, right? That like your opinion's not getting out because the government's, you know, smushing it. Or you're, you have an unpopular opinion here in America and you think the government's, you know, pushing everything. So you want a website or you are, you know, like, like I feel like activism, like that's a space that might take, make use of it. I feel like, maybe like like archival like use cases but i i feel like there's not i feel like that's like a small subset of like what web technologies do i don't feel like it makes sense for most businesses and so like i guess as i'm going like i'm going through these things like i'm like well i don't know that like my job is going to be supplanted by web3 stuff i could end up doing some web3 stuff but i i don't I don't know how much impact it's going to have on like the total number of websites out there. I feel like it's going to be like a 10% or 20% maybe at best. That's just my well, take. There's a lot of infrastructure yeah. issues with it as well, with being able to tra- you know, process a certain number of transactions at a time. So take Amazon. Today, for yeah. Example. If they wanted to improve their logistics by having their warehouses communicate with one another to figure out, you know, throwing some AI in there to figure out to deliver these packages at the most cost effective level with the fastest delivery service possible. It needs to leave from this warehouse, this warehouse and this warehouse, but you also have to keep track of inventory, make sure that that's all kind of kept up to date. So if you had a quote, decentralized private solution for Amazon that it's all interconnected each warehouse is verifying the other warehouse's information and logistics and that kind of stuff, then it can make sense from that kind of aspect, you know, because you can't just say, oh, no, we didn't have three items. We only had one of this item, so we're not going to send something else where it's a employee or some manager who's pocketing stuff. So it creates the idea of blockchain in itself makes it so that if you have enough trusted nodes or enough nodes saying the same thing, then you can't have one outlier node saying something that isn't true. You know, when the majority mm-hmm. has a general consensus. So it it protects against bad data, I guess. But at the cost of, as far as Ethereum or Bitcoin goes, the slower the transactions are. So I think Ethereum is a lot faster than Bitcoin and Solana is even faster than Ethereum, but they still have limits on how much they can process at a given time. So for a company like Amazon, if they were to implement everything that they're doing over in Web3, then how fast are they going to be able to process transactions? Or someone like Shopify, are they really going to be able to handle millions of transactions a second on Web3? And I think that's where we are going to kind of see Web3 grow and grow and grow a bit with some adoption, then it's just going to you know, die because no big company, I think, will really take it serious enough to make it their flagship products. The infrastructure's just not there. I mean, I mean you're... Yeah, I will say Good. that... So, so I, I see this trade-off, right? It, because, yeah, I mean, if, effectively, you have to have a certain number of nodes. They all have to do, you know, a lot of the same work in order to verify that the information they're getting from the blockchain is, you know, valid and things like that. And and that leads into a lot of these infrastructure issues that are there. The flip side is, is that depending on how you have it set up and, and how you trust nodes and verify work, you can have a number of people on that network that don't necessarily have to trust each other, right? Because they can independently check the work and then verify that it, it you know, it makes sense. And that's how blockchain or that's how Bitcoin and a lot of these others actually work. And so if you're working in an instance where, yeah, you just want to bring people in and have them all be able to contribute, then 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 we're starting to talk about something where blockchain makes sense. But otherwise, yeah, I mean, I, I don't necessarily see in the case of, you know, logistics for Shopify or Amazon or some of these other companies, why it wouldn't just make sense for them to essentially send the information out to the nodes that need it via some kind of API that they already have or have it check in with the central authority and 
and just be able to run it that way and not have it run just as efficiently or more efficiently than it would if you were working off of some kind of blockchain system. Now, that's not to say that it's not possible that blockchain couldn't solve some of these issues, but I, I think it's yet to be seen that it could. Yeah. You know, the only real use case that I had thought of for blockchain, and I know there's a lot of use cases out there because all blockchain is, is for those who don't know, you insert in a record into the blockchain. Mm -hmm. And based on the previous record's data, you have a hash and then you create a new hash of that previous hash. And essentially that then says this record we know is valid. We can go back and calculate Mm -hmm. that this record was valid. It was not manipulated. Because if you try to inject in a record that wasn't supposed to be there, then the hashes won't calculate correctly. And then you'll have, Mm -hmm. if it's decentralized, you'll have several nodes saying like, hey, something wrong is going on here. So if you take that idea and make a decentralized blockchain for something like Carfax, which for those in the U.S. know what a Carfax is, but Mm -hmm. outside the U.S., it is a history of a car's activities. So uh, a lot of companies or maintenance shops will report that so-and-so changed their oil at this odometer reading. The odometer reading on this date was this. The car was involved in a minor accident at this point. There was water damage. The title of the car, Mm -hmm. it has a salvage title and all that kind of stuff. So, right. These are the kinds of repairs that were affected yeah. after the So accident. I think a decentralized blockchain that's globally accessible to all for something like that would be good because I remember mm-hmm. going out and buying cars that were like $2,000, $3,000, and you have no idea what's happened to that car. It doesn't really tell you if the car is a good deal or not, but you can get some indication that if this car has been through the ringer and back, it may not last me the four years that I'm planning on this car to last me. So I think there was, back in the earlier 2000s, some issues around people lying about the car faxes. You know, they just kind of made up their own document, put it on the window of the car, says, oh, no, this car is great, never been in an accident. But if you go and run the actual car fax report, it had been in all kinds of things. It has a salvage title and all this other kind mm-hmm. of junk. So I think having something like that would make sense for the blockchain because now we can say that, yes, right here is the actual truth. It's not been manipulated. This is the history of events that this car has gone through. Yeah. This- yeah. And that's, that's the kind of example that I was thinking of, right? Where, yeah, it's down to, hey, you know, I, I can't fake this. I can't manipulate it. I can only report what went on to it, right? I think for me, I think it's a little bit, weak of an argument to say that oh this thing isn't going to work because performance right because i think we've all been around enough to know that like performance just gets better over time so theoretically blockchain's mm-hmm. probably going to get better you know things like that but Definitely. um yeah so while that's a weak argument i i do agree in the sense that like obviously amazon and shopify aren't going to jump on it today right like but whether they jump on it tomorrow i don't know if i could answer that one But I I do think that the things, like I said earlier, the things that make sense to me, right, are we need this thing to be stored for forever or we need there to be a source of truth. Like Mm blockchain is really good at that kind of a thing. Uh, I mean, it's a ledger technology, right? So things that you want ledgers for, your car facts. That's why I think that like blockchain is likely to take over like banking kind of stuff, right? This is what's in my bank account. Well, why do I need an archaic banking system to handle that when theoretically blockchain can handle that? I think. Do I think that bank systems are going to get built around it? I do. I think that, okay, so first of all, I want to be like really careful here. I'm not trying to advertise anything, by the way. I'm just trying to state examples, right? <laughs> so there, there are companies out there that that uh, allow you to basically... McDonald's. Is it McDonald's? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, all right. Let... <laughs> I, there I are want companies my out there. dollar, my my my, my crypto dollar. <laughs> there are companies out there that let you take your crypto of various kinds and sort of like lend them out to other people, right? And and I'm not saying that you should go out and do that tomorrow. That's not the goal of this podcast or anything. What I'm trying to say is that like I think that that sort of represents like a maybe a first look into probably what banking technologies bit, built around crypto are going to be like, if that makes sense. Like I think things like BlockFi and things like that 
are likely are, are they're like pushing the boundaries on what banking looks like and i think that you know obviously some of them are going to go bankrupt some of them you probably should put your money in because they're super sus but like i think that we're going to have a new what do you call it generation sort of of banks like that will exist out there because mm-hmm. i mean when it comes down to it like i mean people understand what cash is sort of you know and they have cash but we still use banks, right? Because banks do sort serve various purposes of, there's like a list of things that they do. And I think right. we'll get the same thing around crypto too, of banks over there. But I think that traditional banks yeah. are either going to do something on crypto or they're going to go away. But my point is, I think there's narrow use cases that we can say, this is what blockchain is good at. And I think that we'll see things get built around that, those things. So ledger, things that ledger technology is good for. Is definitely a thing that I that I think is good, which is why I think that the the rebel in the country or activist groups that are worried about getting silenced, I think they'll make use of Web three because they'll be like, well, it doesn't matter what you do, you can take my hosting down a million times. I can still stay up. Pirate Bay, whether you like them or not, they're probably going to move to blockchain. Like, then you can't die. <laughs> So, I don't know if I've been on Pirate Bay since college. Anyway, <laughs> you know, I draw the line That's... with Web3. If we, if I go to McDonald's and if I order a Happy Meal and instead of a toy, they give me an NFT. That's where I draw the line. So, <laughs> a non fungible toy. That's, uh, that's, that's probably going to happen <laughs> next year. Thanks to you, Dave. Hi, this is Charles Maxwood from Top End Devs. And lately I've been coaching some people on starting some podcasts and in some cases, just taking their career to the next level. You know, whether you're beginner going to intermediate, intermediate going to advanced, whether you're trying to get noticed in the community or go freelance, I've been helping these folks figure out how to get in front of people, how to build relationships and how to build their careers and max out and and just go to the next level. So if you're interested in talking to me and having me help you go to the next level, Go to topendevs.com slash coaching. I will give you a one hour free session where we can figure out what you're trying to do, where you're trying to go and figure out what the next steps are. And then from there, we can figure out how to get you to the place you want to go. So once again, that's topendevs.com slash coaching. What I'm really interested (laughs) about, um, and it's part of the way blockchain works, is not so much the idea that it can't be faked, but the idea that the storage is out there and I don't have to take care of it. I find very attractive the idea of a kind of very distributed database where I can like build a pet project and then the data is kind of floating out there and anyone can access it eventually. I really like the idea of decentralized services with the decentralized, not only on the front end, which we can kind of do now with kind of loads of kind of cloud, you know, caching stuff. But the back end being decentralized as well and potentially around forever, as you say. I don't know if you looked into these systems like the Matrix or Mastodon, which are decentralized Mm -hmm. open source systems, which are essentially attempting to move away from sites like Twitter and Facebook and to kind of run towards a more federated model. I would love to see Ruby Rails infrastructure to make those systems a lot more easier to build. That would be something I'd be really interested in for Web3 so that I could build a Rails site that could leverage those underlying technologies to provide a more robust or less censorable setup. But I've never seen any kind of gems like that to do it. The other thing, looping back to what you were saying earlier, Dave, about these wearable technologies and the glasses chuck was talking about i have tried using some of those and in fact i spent about uh, six weeks coding in vr in japan i bought myself a headset and tried to do some coding on it and one of the things about having a heads up display rather than interacting with a phone is that the pointer comes back remember when mouse overs were like a big deal remember when you were kind of coding all your kind of tool tips and your mouse overs mm-hmm. i do think that is very much going to come back with any kind of wearable display because how are you going to interact with that where well, you're going to have to kind of have some kind of thing on your hand and if you've used the hand controls on these VR things they shoot out like a literal little laser don't they in these little games that's a pointer right so i think we're going to get a kind of it's the return of the tooltip web 0.0 where will displays the tooltips coming back your eyeballs i have to say your eyes. i want to i want to 
speak to the Mastodon approach for a minute because that isn't blockchain, right? We're talking about decentralized systems, but Mastodon, I can't remember the other one you mentioned, but it you know, it's, it's a federated system. Else. Yeah, but that, so effectively what it does is you add it to the Fediverse, I think is what they call it. And then effectively what happens is that it begins to discover the other members of the federated universe that's, that's out there. And then they speak over regular APIs. And so it's a different kind of decentralization. And I, I find that interesting too, just from the standpoint of as we move to kind of a trustless or decentralized model. Yeah. Some of these are going to rely heavily on the advantages you get from kind of a blockchain setup right? The immut- immutability of history and things like that. And some of them, it's really just going to be, hey, look, I can go and I can participate in this federated system to the level that I want on a system that's designed for it and get back whatever it decides to represent to me in this kind of federated system and interact with it in that way without necessarily having to import the entire history of the of the blockchain, the entire ledger or what have you. And so there, there's a lot of interesting interplay that I think comes into that. And, and I really do think that a lot of these decentralized systems, especially since people's trust in large institutions and governments are waning in certain areas, I think we're going to see more and more people drawn to some of these systems that allow them to participate on the level they want to and not have sort of the central censorship or other issues that tend to come out of some of these other places or biases even. I mean, I've, I've heard some people talk about Facebook or Twitter as, as sensorial or s- systems, basically. And then I've heard other people argue that, no, it's just the bias of the people that design the algorithms. Well, either way, having a federated or decentralized system allows me to pick the places that I feel like are best representing the information that I want to get. What Dave has talked about getting the NFTs out for McDonald's, I mean, I don't, I don't understand the NFTs. Not so much. I understand technology, but I don't really understand art and that kind of stuff. So I'm, I'm coming in. I've got a lot. I've got a lot to learn there. But what I think that's really interesting about that concept is the idea that different data has different value, and that value of that data is encoded individually. I think that's a really strong concept. For example, like you know, what is this movie worth online? And that, that, how that could somehow be part of the data. Or similarly, if you've got like a chat server like Slack, yeah, and then the kind of history of that is distributed, mm-hmm. Slack already does that, doesn't it? Slack already charges you for like data older than 30 days. So the recent data is kind of worth nothing and free, but older data is more valuable. It's actually changing. I think that September 1st. Is that changing? It's going to be 90 days oh, instead man. of the past 10,000 messages. I, I, was I was looking forward to non-fungible TV, but well... <laughs> Sorry, Luke. Didn't mean to interrupt. It, it affects different people differently. If, right, but, the, but what I'm saying is this idea, you know, they, we, this kind of stuff is already coming through where they're like, you can keep the new data is not worth anything, but the old data is worth more. And a formal system for kind of encoding that. So for example... If there was a global distributed system which could be kind of storing data much like Slack stores messages, and if it's a personal project, then you can only ever have like the last 10,000 rows of your database, right? But as soon as it starts getting revenue, then you can kind of have a more persistent layer. I can see that coming down the line. I think I think NFTs is a really good example, right, of like what we're dealing with, which is there is hype about the technology itself. And there is hype that's coming from the people who want to buy stuff right now and sell it to other people later for a large profit, right? Speculation, basically, right? There is, which is the problem that NFTs have, because whether you like it or love it, like, that's what's going on. There are some people who are genuinely excited about what the technology can bring. The technology is not ready, right? There's still a large gap between, like, what they need to do to, like, get that whole ecosystem ready to go. Because, you know, what happens Mm -hmm. if I just don't give you the art piece for the NFT that you own, right? Like, until the ecosystem's, like, totally ready for you to, you know, get ownership transferred with the NFT, like, it's not quite ready yet. But but people are still willing to throw money at it and speculate in hopes that they can make money later from somebody else, right? 
and that's caused a lot of sourness as well as a bunch of people that suddenly had a lot more money than they did before. And I think the same thing is going on with like Web3. There are people hoping to, there are people that are genuinely interested in the technology, right? Which is what I think that we're trying to discuss here right now. And there are people who are causing all sorts of issues around it because they're hoping to profit off of everything that's going on in one way or the other. Some of them are willing to put work in in order to profit and I, whatever, kudos to them, great. But the people who are open to leech off of other people, obvious, I think most of us think they should go away. Yeah, I think, so in the same, so with all that kind of like said, like that's how I feel about like the NFT question. I think it's the same kind of question that we have here. I think it's a super cool technology once it's ready or whatever. I don't think it's ready yet. I feel like Web3 is kind of sort of in the same space, but I think it's like a lot more direct. Like I'm going to be asked questions over the next few years of like, hey, uh, you know, you're making this project. Can you do that in Web3? Right. And it's probably going to sound that stupid. Right. And and I'm going to be like, <laughs> what is it that you really want? Like, like, why do you want Web3? It's the same thing that I do when somebody yeah. today tells me, hey, can you use this technology. I want you to do that on React or I want you to do that in this. And I'm like, well, you hired me to be the expert. Why is it that you're thinking this is a good technology? Let's talk about that and let's make a decision together. I feel like it's going to be that kind of thing. I agree. I think it's interesting because we've spent a whole bunch of time talking about kind of this fundamental underlying technology on how we manage the data. And the other question that Dave brought up was effectively like wearables and things like that, which is more the interface, right? It's like what, what capabilities for interaction, you know, does it provide and how does Ruby fit into that? And it, I find that interesting too, to the extent that it's not just, okay, you know, am I going to wear, use glasses? Am I going to have some kind of wearable that allows me to interact with, you know, the world around me? But, you know, also, okay. You know, if I'm if I'm in my home, does it interact with IoT, right? So I can turn the temperature up and down from my glasses in some way. Or if I'm walking past a, a smart device that waters my plants or feeds my dog or, you know, whatever. And is it going to give me an opportunity to interact there? And again, you know, how, how does a, a Ruby or other programming technology function there, right? And then, you know, maybe it does back some data up onto the uh, federated universe or the the blockchain. But, you know, what does that look like? And is that an area that Ruby can get into? And the reason that I'm bringing it up is because we've seen things like Dragon Ruby, right? Where they, you, you have the capability yep. of writing a mobile app in Ruby, but it really hasn't gotten a ton of traction even within the Ruby community. And, and so I'm wondering, you know, as we move to some of these other devices, are we going to see some adoption of an MRuby or Dragon Ruby or something else? that's Ruby-like, or are we going to be forced to essentially manage the the server end of things kind of like we do now with the Rails, and then the interfaces are all going to be written in something else? So the speak on the Dragon Ruby or Ruby Motion thing, I've actually written a Ruby Motion application and published it to the App Store. And mm-hmm. basically my overall experience of that is why did I do it this way? Because <laughs> I, I say that with all the love to Ruby Motion and stuff, but the problem is, is that oh there was no way to avoid the APIs. You still have yeah. to know the Objective C APIs and then translate that into a Ruby equivalent function. And it wasn't easy. I, I was finding it tooth and nail every time. And maybe I just didn't know enough about it or how to handle it properly. But that was a real concern. And that's why I only built one application in Ruby Motion and never again. Because it was just, it was too difficult. I might as well have just done it in Objective-C back then. Instead of layering on some complexity that there was very little documentation on. It's not. It's not actually that different in my experience with other languages. React Native. It's it's a little bit less in React Native, but it's the same problem in React Native. Yeah, no, it is. It totally is. And so I think you're agreeing with me. Is that what you're saying, Chuck? I am. Yeah, okay, yeah. It's really not that different the, in React The Native. difference is, you have to the, the main more. difference is, is, that, is that people have written a lot of, lot more of the abstractions so you can get away with none. But yeah. but yeah, if if you need if you need a native API and there's not some nice little wrapper for it, yeah, just just prepare for the pain. 
Oh, and and all of their documentation is like, oh, you'll just be able to use React Native and you'll never have to write this stuff. There is like literally <laughs> zero apps unless you're just writing like, you know, you can come pet my unicorn when you're done. Yeah, there are like ze- oh, thanks. There are like zero applications that don't need a native API. <laughs> like you just yeah, the moment that you touch anything, <laughs> like you need a native API immediately. And the docs around how to eject and use non <laughs> is so difficult and so tough. And then the best, uh, man, I just bitch for like thirty seconds more. Okay, so then. Then what happens is Apple changes something in their <laughs> API and because Facebook doesn't need it anymore and they don't care, like they just say, oh, we're not supporting this, but they didn't, they don't announce that to anyone. You find out the day that Apple makes the non-revertible <laughs> change that your app is broken. Then, you know, in the next day or so, all these programmers kind of figure out what's going on and then you all come up with workarounds, right? So now you're delivering a workaround app, which you then, of course, have to wait up to 24 hours for, for it to get released. So two days later, your users finally have a quote unquote working version of the app. And, and now you're working on actually fixing it, right? Like, oh, it's such a nightmare. You're, it, yeah. My point is, it's not any different anywhere else. I, I don't think that it's, I don't think it's a Ruby thing. Yeah. Yeah, my my point was that you can pull in wrappers around Cocoa Pods and stuff like that in React Native. Mm-hmm. And yeah, it, it'll hide a lot of that stuff from you so that you never have to touch the native API, but someone did, <laughs> right? Mm-hmm. And yeah, then, then when it stops working because of the reasons that John brought up, yeah, then you're stuck inventing a way to do it natively anyway. Yeah. My thoughts on like why Dragon Ruby and Ruby Motion like haven't taken off isn't so much that there's a problem with them. I think it's because most of the people like not everyone that's doing Ruby is doing Rails, but like such a large portion mm-hmm. of the community is doing Rails. And Rails, I mean, mm-hmm. when you think about it, right, it's a server client architecture, right? Like that's the kind of stuff that right. we make in Rails. I do lots of Rails myself. And I think that that style of thinking doesn't translate as well to like what a lot of the apps are doing. There are obviously lots of server client apps, but I think there's, it it just doesn't necessarily translate to how people are talking about apps. Like people want to do apps without a server and then they end up making a server anyway, but they don't realize it is a server. But, but like the, the things that people are talking about that in, in that space are just different than the way that we think about doing things. And so I think that people that are doing Rails stuff are like, oh, I need to use the different technology. And, to be frank, like it's a lot easier to hire somebody else that's not doing Ruby Motion or Dragon Ruby, and they're more popular. And so there's, I, I think it's about a lot of people think it's separated, and so we just kind of like roll with it. So does that mean we're just out of luck on my glasses? I'm not going to have Ruby uh-huh. glasses. I mean, I mean, if if glasses Ruby come out, glasses. if glasses come out, and a bunch of people that are doing Ruby go do glasses stuff, then everyone will think that you have to use Ruby to do glasses, even though you could do it in Go or any other language. And they'll all jump train and start doing Ruby. Like, I just think it's about like whoever sort of gets popular, like having it's like you can do data stuff in Ruby, but everyone thinks of R and Python. Mm -hmm. Yeah, having set these things for like extended period of time. One thing I can tell you in terms of trying to get information onto these devices is whether it's 2D or 3D. So the web has pretty much got 2D information covered, right? If you want to get, if you've got a flat screen, you want to get stuff up, the web is 100% the way to go. You can do anything you want, the way you go is covered. The big opportunity for change in that ecosystem, because as soon as you're doing a web page, whatever it is, whatever device it is, if it's a web page, doesn't matter what it is, lovely little rail site, away you go, okay? If as soon as it becomes 3D and these displays are now capable of doing like actual 3d as soon as the space becomes 3d and the information becomes kind of augmented reality the web absolutely falls apart and you see a lot of these weird kind of unity game style interfaces coming through and i'd say there's a great threat to the current information ecosystem if these devices are 3d and people want a true 3d display because that is not something the web does well at all and therefore, it's not something that Ruby or Rails is doing very well. Right. That's a good point. My, my question is, is you, you do see a lot of this translated onto like canvas elements on the web and things like that, right? But that's then using like uh, WebGL and you can use Unity on canvas elements, but you're not writing Ruby anymore. 
So, you know, is that kind of the direction we head in where we become polyglots for this stuff? I'm not sure. When I was when I was working on it, what I was doing was I was uh, creating virtual screens. So I had like massive mm-hmm. kind of 40 inch screens floating around. So I'd have like, I don't know, a BS code window open over there, like physically up there above my head. And then I have another one. So I'd have my like view web page view mm-hmm. over there. So I'd have like four virtual monitors. And that's how I was using this technology. Uh, interacting with it but everything's just a flat panel right i'm just moving the panels around to a convenient location but it doesn't have to work that way you can display things in real 3d and as soon as you've got that kind of augmented space like for example something that shows you navigation when you're driving around the web doesn't do that at the moment so because it doesn't do that i think there is a kind of uh, opportunity there for a non-web technology to move into these kind of displays I mean, Rails. Wasn't. I'm in the middle of rereading Ready Player One. I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> if you think about it, like Rails wasn't the first to the scene, right? Like it wasn't well, the true. first like website building technology that was out there. It came later and it polished stuff up, right? Which is the reason why yeah. it became super popular is because it took like the mess that was out there of people tying various things together. And it was like, here, here's a great way to do it better. And boom, everyone's like, oh my gosh, this is so better, right? It's very possible that Ruby isn't the first one to the scene in the 3D space. It's also possible that Ruby or Rails or Rails kind of thing isn't the thing that makes the space better. And so it doesn't become the popular thing over there. It's also possible that someone comes out with 3D ERB and like, you know, we keep getting to use Rails I feel like I'm stretching it pretty far right. here. Just just roll with me. But like maybe... I'm looking forward to reality on Rails. <laughs> so like maybe maybe we get those things, right? And and current technologies just kind of like move along with the space. But mm-hmm. my guess personally would be that the way that we build websites and the way that we build 3D technologies are likely to look very different. And I right. don't think that that's a problem. Like I don't know if any of you guys remember like RPG Maker or whatever. So my first, yes, my first cool. actual, okay, my first introduction to Ruby was when my one of the people in the hallway of the dorm that I lived in, like, just came down to my room and was like, "Hey, you're a programmer. Help me with this problem because it should be easy for you, right?" And they were just trying to do make an RPG and RPG Maker, and there was like in Ruby, and I had never seen Ruby before this. And basically, what it, what is it? What was it at the end of the day? It was like there was some stuff that the program itself gave to you, and then you could write Ruby code to sort of like add on to it, right? And when you're talking about mm-hmm. Unity and a lot of these other things, that's what you're doing too. Like your uh, or the StarCraft II editor, or like a lot of these things, right? They give you a lot of stuff. They're like, hey, you can make widgets. And uh, you can have the widgets do things and you can edit certain aspects of their behavior. And here's some scripting language, whatever it is, right? C sharp or anything, whatever they choose to give you, Lua. And then you write in that scripting language to edit something, uh, some aspect of it. And I believe Unity is like C sharp or something. I don't know, Luke, you actually could probably answer that question since you apparently actually use it. But regardless, it's not Ruby. And maybe somebody comes up with an editor, right? That does use Ruby, like who knows? Or we all learn a different language to do 3D stuff. I'm just looking forward to seeing the lawsuits of people saying like, your website made me throw up. (laughs) Right. So my question is, because, you know, at the end of the day, what we're talking about, you know, this is a Ruby podcast, is, is there a way that we can, as a community, be setting ourselves up to be that thing that John's talking about, right? Where we are the the lingua franca of mm. stacking on top of Unity or the, where, where the preferred scripting language for some of these particular problems. We need 3D ERB. I need to be able to like have my Rails application generate a 3D space but, and insert my this, stuff, right? <laughs> With ERB text. 3D dot text field. <laughs> I don't... Does Firefox, I, I don't... <laughs> Does Firefox still have that view where you can look at like the HDR elements in 3D? Do you remember that one? No. You know, I watched Jurassic Park recently, the original one back in the late 90s. And one of their computer control systems had like that little 3D thing that you had to like navigate. Yeah. 3D file system, system, yeah. Yeah. So that's why I imagine. That was high tech. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's a good thing. It's a good thing it wasn't real because I don't want to make that yet. <laughs> I mean, maybe tomorrow. I, okay. There's a lot of things that I would like to make. I just don't want to make it with the tools that I have today. That seems terrible. 
yeah. a flyover interface for your iPhone. Mm. Yeah. Well, you can, you know, you, like I said, there's, there's free JS. You can do it. It's just really painful to do because you have to kind of go through right. JavaScript to do it. So the whole kind mm-hmm. of, you know, server-side rendering kind of thing largely falls apart. I had a I had a big win. I had a big win at work converting a colleague to the Rails seven side. We I I got him. I got I converted him from React to Hotware and Stimulus, and we replaced like hundreds of lines of React code with like a Stimulus controller. And it was, oh, it was wonderful, you know. And when you have an experience like that, say we're going to take all of this stuff, we're going to throw it out, we're going to do this. That feels like the future. It feels like the future where you have a whole load of stuff that was really hard before. Like, oh, you don't need any of that. You just need this. Away you go. So that those are the technologies that, that are win, right? So what we if were going Web3, through your. So what if again? Web three was really just undoing all that React and Angular? <laughs> <laughs> Dave wants to make as many people cry as possible. <laughs> so, so speaking about Web three, so so <laughs> let's let's ask the same question. Let's ask the same question about Web Web three act. Yeah, like so, how would Ruby, for example, like work with with Web three? And to be honest, like I think one aspect of it that would matter would be like the database thing, like Luke was mentioning. Like to be honest, like I think that as people create blockchain based databases, eventually. One of them will be solid enough that, you know, someone will create an integration for it and that other that we can use as a database backend. Mm-hmm. And then the other aspect of it that I think will matter for us is going to be like servers. Right. So I don't think that Web3 servers are really like even remotely close to being ready. So I'm not sure how to answer that once. It, but you just would wait till the server technology came out and then use that instead of whatever your current hosting well, is. Really, the CPU cycles that I think would be a bigger concern because, you know, right now with a normal NFT or any kind of transaction on the blockchain, you're just posting a record, you're verifying the record, essentially, you know, Mm -hmm. in its most simple form. But if we were to really embrace Web3, yeah, sure, you had the database side of things, but then you also had the CPU cycles. So it's... A you have one request. You know, I'm Joe Schmo, and I want to visit this website to consume some of the data, and I want to perform some kind of action on there. Well, that action that I perform on there, what if it was a video transcoding job or something, or some kind of image manipulation that had a higher mm. CPU cycle requirement than someone just browsing Reddit or whatever? So I think that's where we're going to start having problems. And it rightly could get abused where you have someone taking up someone, a bunch of other people's CPU cycles. So it's really just the server side software that you're hosting, you know, just like the, the Bitcoin client that you install on your computer. You just download the full node and then it downloads the entire blockchain history. So yeah, you have that storage aspect, but the CPU cycles just aren't there. But if you, with Web3, start introducing server requests, so I guess ideally, the only way I can really see Web3 kind of working is if it is a more of a Lambda style function base. So you don't have entire server applications running on Web3, essentially. But if you were to just put this function that authenticates a user on the blockchain, you know, that's probably a bad example. I don't think I would trust any decentralized thing to do the user authentication. But regardless, just take that as an example. So that's just one small Lambda function. And then you have your website hosted somewhere or on some decentralized storage thing like a if they made Chia, which is a storage-based blockchain, if they kind of converted those Chia farms over to storage spaces for web con- consumption, which is viable because they already have 22 exabytes of data on that blockchain, which is insane. That's huge. So if you do something like that, then it could actually make sense because you have these small functions that are just a part of each transaction instead of a full application. I think you're hitting like 
my point is I don't think that uh, web applications like Rails applications, right, are really going to make Web3. I think that yeah. websites, quote unquote, on Web3 are just going to be static web pages for the most part. And if you go to the application side, I think they're going to probably look like Chia and whatever the other first one that was on the Ethereum chain was or whatever, the Cats one or whatever, right? Like, I think they're probably all going to look like that, where you have to write basically like a, a, another blockchain, so to speak, that's like an app blockchain, right? And so you're mm-hmm. just, you're piggybacking on Ethereum or something that allows you to run functions basically on other people's computers. And that's that's your app, right? Like, I think those apps will exist potentially, and I think that static page apps, right, because then you could have a general client that reads a blockchain, right, and that's how it would read your website, right, and then display it could work. But I, I don't see Rails applications really existing on the blockchain itself. That's that's my right. sense of uh, the, the way that I kind of envision it, at least for the most part, is, yeah, essentially what you're saying where you get an update off the blockchain, Right. Because you're talking to the other nodes, you apply the, the changes in the ledger to your own database, your own Web2 database, and then you effectively provide a Web2 client, right, where then you have the interactions and then whatever transactions you have to write to the blockchain, eventually you farm a block and put it back on. Yeah, I mean, you would. And so you would definitely have to make use of sort of the sidekick, right, would be <laughs> your sidekick queue would become yeah. the blockchain and you really wouldn't be able to do instant puts or instant posts, right? They would have to become right. a job sort of on the blockchain, which would eventually change the site. Right. Or a block of data where you have a very simple understanding that you're just you're just working off the ledger. But yeah. Anyway, we've been going for about 55 minutes. Is there anything else that anyone has burning desire to bring up on this before we do picks? Yeah. There's one more thing. So at the moment, I kind of pay for hosting. Okay, we're talking about decentralization. I pay a particular company for hosting, right? I'm sure you do. And uh, there exist various systems out there like Terraform, which look to kind of make Mm -hmm. it easier to move your hosting around. I do think that there's a strong possibility in the near future that that will be abstracted using a technology like Docker Containers so that you will be able to kind of containerize your app and then it will kind of go out there and be hosted wherever and Mm -hmm. you won't really know where it is. I can see that being kind of viable and instead of the kind of ports being basically static within, you know, how you set up Docker ports, those then are more dynamic and the payment again is more dynamic. I, I can see that coming down in the medium term as like a tangible way that this could become a reality. That'd be interesting because then there's nothing that forces you into sort of the infrastructure that we're used to. And I could then see if you're going to Dockerize and blockchainize your application, then I could actually conceivably run a local copy, right? And so I could have some app that effectively, when I pull up the web page, it launches my app, you know, it launches the web page locally on its own, you know, container locally and then pulls the data off of the ledger or something like that. I don't know exactly where that goes, but it, there are interesting possibilities with it. That is super interesting. I think the only problem that I see with that, which is totally solvable, right, is that I can't think of any blockchains that can hold like layer sized chunks of data, right? So, yeah, it would be you would need a blockchain that can hold a block of data that's, you know, gigabytes large or whatever. And I don't think there's any blockchains right now that hold that much in one block. But but I'm sure that's solvable. So, yeah, yeah or the parts that it has to Maybe. hold are only the parts that are different. Right. So then it's not gigabyte sizes, it's megabyte sizes. Well, small. I have some yeah. I have some large layers in some of my containers or whatever that are like many gigs. Yeah. Large, but yeah. So it would have to be a large size. Anyway, that's actually right, a really well, good thought. Picks. I didn't actually. So sorry, I, I want to like jump onto what Luke no, said ahead. really quick. I actually hadn't really thought of it that way. But yeah, if if we create a browser that pulls like container layers, right, or, or some sort of equivalent kind of idea off of a blockchain and then sort of like spins it up locally and runs it, you could do more complex stuff. Mm-hmm. All right, I'm done. All good. All right, let's do picks. Hey, folks, if you love this podcast and would like to support the show, or if you wish you could listen without the sponsorship messages, then you're in luck. 
We're setting up new premium podcast feeds where you can get all of the episodes released after Christmas 2020 without the ads. Signing up will help us pay for editing and production, and you can go sign up at devchat.tv slash premium. John, you were just talking. Keep talking. What are your picks? Okay, so I uh, pulled up Ruby Weekly today, and I was surprised, pleasantly surprised, to find in it something that I actually use. And I could have sworn that I had this. I found it. Okay, I had this tab open because I was like, I'm going to pick this today. So in Ruby Weekly, there was a thing on Gem Compare or whatever, which is uh, this thing that allows you to kind of like use, you're basically using Gem or, or yeah, you're using Ruby's Gems or whatever to like compare the diff between like the old version of the Gem and the new version of Gem. And I, in the middle of an upgrade project right now, and it's totally very useful to me. I think it's super awesome. And so I wanted to give it a plus one sort of. So that's really awesome. And y'all should check that out. So that's useful. So that's my one pick. And for my second pick, I have been eating a lot of chips and salsa lately. And I don't live in Texas anymore. And so I feel like getting good salsa is really hard. Uh, I live out in North Carolina and everyone just seems to like these like sweet and sugary salsas. And I'm like, I don't want any of that. I mean, I'm sure that the salsas that I've eaten have tons of sugar in them because I live in America and literally everything has tons of sugar (laughs) in it. But it, it doesn't. That's not like the main profile of the flavor, right? Like, so the salsas that I like, you know, like taste like tomatoes and peppers and things like that, right? Mm-hmm. So, and they just probably have sweeteners in there and I just don't pay attention. But anyway, so I've been doing a lot of trying to find good salsas lately because they took away my really, really good salsa. And anyway, I found, I found one that I can like eat or whatever. And so I was just like, oh, let's talk about this. So I've just been doing like a lot of her des, which is like, it's whatever. That's what I found. So it's her des salsa. It's just better than, than the other terrible ones out there. That's what I got. So it's a great, it's a great, amazing review. No, it's good stuff. Their salsa verde is my favorite. Yeah, I actually got their salsa verde and I actually enjoyed it. So yeah, but, but mostly I've just been eating their, their house salsa, mm-hmm. just like salsa yep. cassetta or something like that. Good. Cool. Luke, what are your picks? I got boring picks after your delicious picks. So I've been watching this talk from RailsConf 22 from Vladimir Dementiev, which is called The Pitfalls of Real Timeification. And this is a kind of drill down into using the hotware wire style stuff in Rails and kind of real life issues you get when you try to build. He takes a chat app, but I'm hitting a lot of the same issues in my projects. That he described in this talk and i'll be honest with you it's not a very it's not a great talk all right it's not it's not particularly entertaining or you know but i'm picking it because the actual things he discusses in it are really really great and i wish i'd watched it when i was building my little kind of real-time front-end thing and my second pick which i'm sure people picked before is this book from pragmatic programmers called agile web development for rail 7 I um, had a new team member who's from more kind of React uh, JavaScript background. And I said, look, come and have a look at the stuff in Rails 7. Have Come and have a look at the stimulus stack. Come and have a look at what you can do without having an enormous kind of single page app and have really positive feedback from him about this book and the approach. So that's my second pick is the Agile with Development Rails 7 book. And if any if anyone knows like a better kind of Rails 7 book, I'd be very grateful to hear about it. Cool. Dave, what are your picks? So I have two picks. One is the Logitech MX Mechanical Keyboard. I recently picked one up and I really have been enjoying it. I got the clicky version and I, I really like it. It's pretty cool. Is that the official name or is it just loud? It's the official name, clicky. Okay. They have clicky, tactile, and linear, I think. Yeah. Okay. So did, did it it's basically, say what? What's that? Did it say what the keys were? So clicky, I think, is the MX blues, and then the tactile quiet are browns, and okay. linear is the reds. I think so. They're pretty cool. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's pretty cool. And then the second pick, I'm gonna kind of take one of Chuck's kind of pick things here is a board game called Beat the Parents. I got it and played it with my kids. Essentially, you basically it's a trivia game. And a challenge game that you get to play with the kids. And it's parents versus kids. Kids have trivia questions, you know, aged at the kids. Parents have parent-related trivia questions. 
And the deal is you have to put something up for steak. So we played and I said that the kids can have two scoops of ice cream for dessert. And they put up that they won't have any ice cream for dessert. So we got to play and they won. So they got two scoops of ice cream. But it's kind of fun. Nice. It looks like it's two to six players, 30 minute playtime. Board Game Geek weights it at 1.2, which is a good kid game. All right. I'm going to throw out some picks. Or did you have something else? No, I think that's it. I did play Dice Forge the other day with the kids, and they really enjoyed it, too. So thanks for that suggestion. That's a fun game. Yeah. Yeah, I've enjoyed that game quite a bit. I'm going to throw out another game pick. This one's called Antidote, and it starts out, you pull out one of the cards with an X on it. Those are the poisons. And then you uh, shuffle the rest of the poisons and syringes together so everybody gets two cards. And then you shuffle the antidotes together and you deal them out. And the antidotes are numbered one to five. They're all different colors and shapes. And what you do is you take turns deciding what's going to happen. So you can trade somebody an X card or you can you can trade somebody any card or you can have everybody pass a card to the left or to the right. Or you can have everybody pass a card they know is not useful to the left or the right. Right. And then or you can have them discard a card. And every time you discard a card, you discard the card face up. And unless it's a poison card or a syringe, in which case you discard it face down, and then somebody can use a syringe to grab it and put it in their hand. But effectively, what you're trying to do is you're trying to have the highest numbered card of the correct antidote at the end of the game when you're when everybody's down to one card. So anyway, it's it's a lot of fun. It plays in about 30 minutes. Board Game Geek, it's two to seven players, and Board Game Geek weighted it at 1.6. So your your preteens can play it and figure it out. But you start watching, okay, somebody put down three blue poisons in their own beaker, so I'm going to get rid of mine too. Or when I started, I started with two X cards. And so if I wind up trading X cards, I'm not going to trade this one. So nobody has the information that they absolutely know that it's, a card they can get rid of, right? And so then they have to decide at the end of the game between what's actually not in anybody's hand and the one that I've kept in my hand the whole time until I discarded it at the end of the game. So anyway, it's stuff like that. So you start playing some of those strategies, but it, it was fun. I played it with a couple buddies of mine and my 13-year-old daughter and uh, one of the other guy's 13-year-old sons, and everybody played it just fine. It wasn't, wasn't beyond them at all. So anyway, I'm going to pick that. And then just want to let folks know, I think we're a couple weeks out. We might just be one week out. I can't remember on this show, but uh, Rails Remote Conf website's up. DHH has confirmed for Monday at 8.30 on September 26th. If you want to speak, just go to the website, click on CFP. If you want to attend, then go ahead and buy one of the tickets. Uh, the way that we're structuring it is the first four days are talks, and then the last day is a workshop. And you can buy two days, which is the first two days, four days, which is all the talks, or you can get everything, including the workshops. If you want to do a workshop, let me know, too, because I'm actually the upgrade price on that ticket. I'm splitting with the workshop instructors. So anyway, yeah, as we get more people involved in that, I'll let you all know. But th that's what we're doing. And then the next conferences after that are JavaScript, Angular and Top End Dev Summit or Top End Devs Remote Conference, which is uh, careers. It's how to level up and get a better job and stuff like that. So anyway, the, those are the things that I am working on. And then, yeah, I mentioned this. I've been listening to Ready Player One again, and I really enjoy that book. Uh, it's it's one of it's one of my favorites. And so I'm going to pick that. Is the book different uh, the, from the movie? Yes. Yeah. The the premise is the same, right? Where they're doing yeah, I'm dying for the Easter egg. They changed a few things in the movie that bother me, but I, I have to say it's it's a good movie. Ready Player Two. So Ernest Klein wrote a sequel to Ready Player One. Don't bother. So, yeah. <laughs> anyway. Yeah, that's all I have to say about that. It was a terrible book. But Ready Player One's awesome. So, anyway, those are my picks. We'll go ahead and wrap it up here. This was a fun chat, guys. Yeah. All right, folks. Till next time. Max out. Right. Talk care. to you later. Bandwidth for this segment is provided by Cashfly, the world's fastest CDN. Deliver your content fast with Cashfly. Visit C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com to learn more.